started in real estate about 15 years ago. Um, started out with a team of right now. Well, right now we have a team of 33 realtors, 10 support staff, and we help a little over 700 uh, buyers, sellers, and investors every single year. All Royal LePage Canada, and I appreciate that, man. Um, right across Royal LePage, uh, the brand, which is about 20. 2,000 realtors coast to coast, uh, my team is number one. And, and, and myself and my business partner, uh, we manage that team. And, and I knew right away, man, man I, was, I was hooked to what money afforded me, which was freedom. I worked at the, at the bank for a while, for about three years at CIBC, kind of in my late teens, um, just squeaked by, squeaked by high school, never went into like post-secondary. What is up YouTube, Matt McKeever here, and in today's video, we catch up with Jazz Tacker for part two of my interview series with him. If somehow you guys missed part one, make sure you jump over and watch it, but in part two, we're just gonna dive deeper into his experiences when it comes to becoming a successful salesperson, building relationships with your customers, and we even just share some tips and best practices in regards to going out there and using social media as an effective tool. Again, like myself, there was a time when Jazz really wasn't taking it that seriously. But for both of us, there was a light bulb moment where it clicked and we realized the power in social media. But anyways, let's dive into today's video. Yeah, I love that. That's great. Really love exploring this entire theme. Before I kind of wrap up and pivot here, I'd love to just hear like practical tips for someone breaking in to becoming a new realtor, especially if they don't have a lot of sales experience. You know, your tip about like answering the phone. I can't stress enough how critical that is at the start. If someone's willing to have a conversation with you, you have to be willing to have a conversation back. But what other things come to mind? You know, if you were starting fresh out as a realtor, you've got one year runway, it's either make or break here. What would you be doing? First things first, I would get an assistant. And, and I know that to somebody who's listening right now, who's starting out, um, and this is experience, not only for me doing this for 15 years, but watching hundreds upon hundreds of realtors enter the business, okay? And, and just watch them in my office as well. I know you're sitting there thinking, there's no way I can afford an assistant. No, you can afford not, not to get an assistant. Figure it out, okay? And because here, he, here's what happens with new realtors and really just new salespeople in general in any industry, you wear too many hats and it's just too hard to do everything. And what happens is, A, you're not, it's too hard to do from a time perspective. B, you're probably not an expert at everything. You, you might think you are like you're a good marketer or you're an expert at, at marketing and you're an expert at paper paperwork and all that kind of stuff, but you're probably not. And then three, you, you have two jobs. Your jobs, as a, your jobs as a realtor is to meet people and help them buy, sell, and invest. That's it. Meet people, help them buy, sell, and invest. Everything else should be delegated. Everything else should be delegated. In fact, it's why I see most realtors when they get into their first year, even their second year, Matt, it's why they don't make it because they spend all their time printing out listing paperwork and CMAs like comparative market analysis or, or, or putting up their own for sale signs and putting up a lock box. That time needs to be spent, that bandwidth, and I'm not talking about the internet bandwidth, I'm talking about the bandwidth in here, needs to be spent on meeting people. Because when you meet more people, they will introduce you, they will introduce you to, to, to more people, period. Your network is your net worth is determined by your network. We all know that, but now you have to put it into action. And so the first, first tip I would say, get, a, get an assistant. You don't need to pay them $100,000 a year. You're paying them 35 to $40,000 a year, but they're giving you back minimum of 40 hours of your life every single week. And all that empty, all that extra time is going to be spent on meeting more people and actually doing deals. You need to do the negotiations. That's what you need to do. I mean, I hear it all the time. Well, Jazz, you know, I like to have my listing paperwork done a certain way, train them figure it out. And even if they do it at 80% of what you did, I, you now just freed up extra time. And then I, I, I want you to find three ways how you're going to get business. You need three funnels of, of getting business. One, and the one that is a no brainer to me anyways, is your warm market, your database marketing, your, 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 your relationship marketing. Okay. That's your one. And then two other ways, practical ways. It might be door knocking, cold calling, 
open houses, uh, uh, social media, online marketing. There's, I probably have like 53 ideas that I can run off. Um, I don't care what you pick, pick two others. And so you have three, I actually have this phone on a, on a gorilla pod. It has three legs. It's always a good reminder for me and how to have a strong foundation. And, and those are really the two main things. Everything else will take care of itself. But for me, the biggest one was delegation. Like I haven't went on MLS for, I don't know, four or five years myself. At least four or five years, I have not logged. I don't even have the authenticator, which gives me the code anymore because someone else can print off all that paperwork. Someone else can bring that to me. I need to look through it from a negotiation perspective, not waste my time with printing things. I don't even have a laptop anywhere, Matt. I don't even own a laptop. I, mean, I haven't touched a laptop in close to three years now. Why? Because I was wasting time on it. I wasn't really doing much. You know, like I like to do this. I want to do this and be in front. So once we finish this, Matt, I have a Zoom call with another client. I have three more lined up for the day. And then I'll be doing some outbound calls that I had to make. Uh, but that's where the business is. That's where the real money is with you meeting with people, not behind a computer screen. Yeah, absolutely agree. And this really applies even outside of just realtors, right? Even for real estate sure. investors or really any professional. And the idea of hiring a... And admin at the start, especially if you're not successful, successful or you don't have the proof of concept is very intimidating. But the idea of outsourcing the lowest dollar value items on your to-do list is really important. Um, I know a mentor of mine refers to a money sheet in a parking lot. And so the money sheet is shit that puts money in my bank account today or as soon as possible. And the parking lots, all the stuff that I probably should eventually do, but the wheels of the business won't fall off if I don't do it. And hiring an admin and having them tackle a lot of your parking lot items is absolutely cr crucial and just really opening up your bandwidth in regards to tackling those most important tasks. And I find with a lot of salespeople, so for myself, you know, I've got a team of wholesalers. Wholesaling is similar in certain ways to being a realtor as well. And one of their biggest struggles is time management and really just understanding what's actually important. And for us and our team, what we ended up having to do was just literally reverse engineer step by step how we make money. So the last step in the process is literally pick up check from lawyer, deposit into bank account. And we slowly worked our way back through all those steps and we decided collectively as a team, it really is important to do the things closest to the money first, make sure that we're crossing those T's, dotting those I's and then work our way down. Because when we're talking about, you know, the different marketing channels you could tackle as a realtor or a wholesaler for that matter social media sounds good and it's got shiny object syndrome but you could literally spend 12 hours a day on social media and still not put any money in the bank so finding that balance is absolutely crucial you can easily fall in the rabbit hole right of, of, of somebody's watching this right now on youtube and and then the next video pops up and the next video pops up time chunk that like do that at a certain time do that when you're in the bathroom do that when you're like do, you know when you have some free time you choose whenever that is for you but definitely you can get caught up in the rabbit hole and look i mentioned that it's not going to cost you a hundred thousand dollars you can go on indeed.ca right now if, it, if you're listening and watching in canada um and anywhere else indeed.com and just put up a posting and all you'll be shocked and amazed how much how much uh, a response you'll get by just putting out something at fifteen dollars an hour you know um or even interns and that you can't do on indeed but i i i start all my media squad as interns first because i want to make sure their their work is good but not from their portfolio i want to see what they can do within my system um and my culture but i start them as interns then unpaid interns then part-time, then full-time. And everyone's been through that same process. There's six, uh, six of them now in total. And that's how they started. And that's how they all started. But after a few months, I kind of upgrade them because A, I know that they're having fun and B, I know, and, and B, I know that their work is good. But from an assistant perspective, you can find so many assistants. It's not as expensive as you think it is. And here's a little hack as well that I do. When I bring an assistant on board, now when I bring any admin staff on board, I also let them know that, that I'm going to be marketing to, I want to market to their database, their network, and if they get their license, they can make money. I can give them a referral fee when they're licensed, and they can essentially, essentially make 
what they're making in salary on the side for doing no work just by me just just by me emailing and calling their on the side what i'm paying them I'm actually making back in, in, in how much real estate I'm selling. So that's been something that's worked really well for me in the last four or five years. Yeah. Do you want to get control of your financial life? Do you want to crush it in real estate with wholesaling? Do you want to join my full-time team of wholesalers like Mike or Shahir? Or what about Tyler or Diego? Or what about Amar? All right. And what do we do, boys? We make offers. We buy fast. Never going to we pay cash, offers, 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 deals, deals, deals. Tell us, Mr. Seller, what, what price do you feel? Because we're Southwestern's biggest source of deals. Boom. So if you guys want to crush it with wholesaling, you need to join my team. And down below, video description, there's all the links you need. On the side, what I'm paying them. I'm actually making back in, in, in how much real estate I'm selling. So that's been something that's worked really well for me in the last four or five years. Yeah, I, I love that. We actually have a similar sort of sentiment amongst my team of wholesalers as well. So I've really tried to flip their thinking process on their head and just understand every single piece of real estate you see that we don't own, there's a problem there. So we need to get in contact with that, that owner and find out whether we can buy it. So, you know, uh, I've got a lot of young, aggressive dudes on my team, just the way it happened to shake out. And I was like, when you're at the bar, what I want you thinking of is not asking for someone's phone number, but asking for their landlord's phone number. That literally <laughs> yeah. needs to be the level of thinking that we have here. And I love that you're really maximizing the existing network of any of your team members as well. That's absolutely critical. More attention's more attention. It's the reason That's why it. both of us do social media. A hundred percent. Right. And, and to me is if, if I'm already emailing clients, I'm already inviting them to events, webinars, live events. Um, it makes really no sense for my team not to invite their family and friends. And it's, and it could be, um, a lucrative and a, even just an added on incentive, right? It might just pay for a vacation of theirs if one of their clients end up purchasing or if they purchase themselves as well. And so, um, as I mentioned, that's something that I started about four or five years ago and I, I've just seen it work really well. Love it. So let's loop back. Originally, at the very start of this conversation, you talked about you became a realtor really to learn about real estate investing. So how did your real estate investing journey evolve? Did you do that in parallel or did you end up kind of putting the desire for passive income on the back burner while you built up this active business and income? Yeah, so um, it's exactly the way that I worked out where I was actually, I knew I needed to sell real estate take that money and, in, and invest it into real estate. That, that was always my game plan. Whatever money I made, I'm not a, I'm not a big uh, spender in terms of things. It's just not who I am. Um, not that there's anything wrong with it. Whoever has it, that's them, right? Um, I wear kind of the same t-shirt every single day. I do shower and change my shirt. It's just a similar t-shirt that I wear. Um, but but I, I wanted to, the game plan from the get was, I'm gonna make money in real estate, selling real estate taking those commissions and investing into real estate. And me being, I'm, I'm more of a lazy investor, right? I think everyone finds kind of what, everyone should try to find what works well for them. Mm -hmm. um, and I like the greater Toronto area. I'm born and raised here. You can say a street to me and I'll know it. You know, like if you say, to, say a street in London and Ontario, I have no idea if it's a good street or a bad street. So just, I stay in my lane. And the one, one, uh, uh, easy strategy I found that works well for me personally is condos and pre-construction condos at that because my access to builders because of the content that we do and the fact that we've been doing it so long I get the pricing very very early for myself and my clients and there's there's there, there's there's the nice thing about a pre-construction condo that I don't have to get a mortgage for it right away. It allows me to buy time until the building gets built. And so with those two things, and, and I get to, my down payment is paid out over time. As I get paid in my fees and commissions over time, I can also start putting that in installments for my down payment. And so I just thought it was, yeah, the strategy from the start was, make money in real estate by selling real estate. And now I do, I have the residual income from my team as well. And then, and, and take that and invest it into real estate. Awesome. Love it. Yeah. I think a lot of people, when they originally get drawn to real estate investing, they're drawn to the idea of passive income, 
But most that really want to build a real portfolio, a scalable portfolio, find that they actually need to generate an active component, whether that's being a realtor, a mortgage agent, a wholesaler, a flipper, something along those lines that allows you to build that war chest so that then you can siphon off some of the funds into building up that passive portfolio. So, yeah, so I, I totally agree, right? It's, there's nothing wrong with uh, 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 like wait. You just got to wait. You got to have some patience with real estate. That's what it is, right? I think there's a, I, what I find anyways, right? In business and in real estate. It's why the podcast that I do really covers entrepreneurship and real estate like you do as well, Matt. And I love those two topics because, again, there's so much crossover between the two, right? One, uh, you need to take action. I don't care what you do, if in business or as a real estate investor. But the second thing is you need to have patience. You got you to gotta just wait it out a little bit. And the real wealth, the real wealth is made over that long period of time in real estate, that long period of time in business. The more that you cultivate your staff and the relationships in your business, the more that you, the, the more that you put in time from a tenant perspective and you take care of your property, you take care of your tenants, you're going to create that much more wealth over a long period of time. And I find it just comes down to patience. That's all. Yeah, patience is absolutely key, particularly for buy and hold investors. It really is that concept of time in the market, not trying to time the market. So true. So my audience is really big kind of number nerds. You know, they love to see numbers and stuff of that aspect. I don't think we're going to have enough time today to really dive deep into the condo investing uh, perspective, but I'd love to explore that in a future video. But just sure. overall, your strategy, do you mind sharing you know, is this primarily a cash flow play? Is this an appreciation play? How does that factor? So it's it's cash flow play from the perspective of that the rental income will cover my expenses. So they'll cover my mortgage payment with 20% down. They'll cover my mortgage payment, uh, condo fees, property tax, and the $20, $25 a month for, for, for insurance as well. But the cash flow I'm talking about is probably a hundred bucks a month, nothing to retire off right away, okay? Uh, the play really is, is the, is the principal pay down um, as well as the passive appreciation. And so in the greater Toronto area, if we look at a sample size of the last 40 years, we see 6.9% year over year increase. I also know that we have 200,000 people coming to the greater Toronto area year after year for the next 10 years. So we're going to have 2 million people. But the biggest thing for me is as an investor is that I know we're kind of landlocked here, right? Like the south of the city, you can't mm -hmm. build because of the lake. And then on the northern part, you got the you got the Greenbelt legislation. There's applications right now as we speak to build on top of Yorkdale Mall, like, like legit yeah. build right on top of it, right? So that obviously tells me basic supply and demand we have a lot more demand than we do supply and it's not gonna get any better anytime soon because it takes 10 years from when an application goes in to when a shovel goes into the ground and so i always look at manhattan and and what happened there and what happened what is happening there till this day too much demand not enough supply values keep on increasing now Unlike, unlike the, the, like Alberta or, or um, like even Vancouver because of the foreign investment, because they're so close to, to Hong Kong, for example, um, we don't really manufacture anything here either, right? Like there's, it's not like we're based on the oil industry. Our pricing is not based on that. It's very service-based. And, and because of population growth, one thing we are lacking here from a world-class city perspective is transit. So if you can buy near transit or on a transit line, you're definitely going to see higher, higher values and better from a rentability perspective. But I like also the class of the tenants that we get here. They're most of my tenants and the thousands of applications I get to see every year for my clients. I mean, they're all making, you know, hot, in the, in that 75, $85,000 range minimum, if not higher. Um, and, and they're there for they're there for a longer period of time. I'm not turning over tenants. And as long as my building is built after November 15, 2018, I can increase the rents to whatever I like as well. Um, and so you're going to see with cash flow, passive appreciation and principal pay down, you're going to be looking at anywhere 26, 27% year over year return. And for me, that's what I like. I'm good with that. And, and, and I don't need the 
18, 19% year over year passive appreciation that you see in some of the other provinces. I'm okay with the 6%. Slow and steady for me. I'm 38 years old, and I'm, I'm I'm creating my portfolio for the long term, passing it on to the kids if if they're good, um, and treat me well. They'll get it. If not, we'll see who it goes to. But um, uh, very it, it's it is very passive because I'm picking up 500 square 500 square foot condos. Not much goes wrong with these things, um, and there's not much managing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I'd love to explore this business model in depth in a future video, but really appreciate you taking the time for this video in particular. If people want to follow along with you on your real estate investing journey or you're building a realtor business journey, what's the best way to do so? I appreciate that, Matt. It's jazztakar.ca, J-A-S-T-A-K-H-A-R. Dot ca. It's the easiest way. Um, all my podcast episodes are there. My animations, my blog, the whole, the whole nine yards. Everything is there, and there's a way to stay in touch with me through my monthly newsletter um, and updates on the upcoming book and and all the content. And so it's jazztakar.ca. And and thanks for asking, Matt. I appreciate that again. Yeah, and just thanks again, Jazz. Thanks again to Jazz for taking the time to just really sit down with me and break down his experience as a realtor, as well as how he was able to parlay that into becoming an investor himself, but even more importantly, how he's been able to use social media as a successful tool to build his brand and his business. I think with time, we're all gonna realize that there was this huge opportunity when it came to brand building and social media, but really how many of us are taking advantage of it. So I really appreciate Jazz just sharing his experiences and his perspective when it comes to social media. If somehow you guys watched part two but you didn't watch part one, check out part one right here. Otherwise, if you just want more great Canadian real estate content, check out this playlist right here. I'll see you guys in the next video.